Welcome to Progenesis Academy. For those who are not familiar with our program, we are a nonprofit, non biased program dedicated to embryology and reproductive genetics. If you have attended some of our webinars in the past, you can claim your certificate of attendance. Many of our webinars are honored by AAB for CU credits. You can also watch all our webinars on YouTube channel Progenesis Academy or our website Progenesis slash Academy. Today's topic is oocytes and embryos, vitrification and storage management. We have two excellent speakers, starting with Debbie Venier. She is the co-founder and director of trainer at the World Embryology Skills and Training. And we have Marlene Engel. She is a lab director at Generation Fertility Center at the University of Wisconsin. Thank you so much. We're going to start our first presentation by Debbie. All right, so um, Nabil asked uh, Marlene and I to talk about oocyte and embryo vitrification and storage management to include different um, techniques and uh, witnessing protocols and kind of issues that we have with storage. So it's a lot of topics to cover, but I'm just going to kind of briefly touch on a few um, subjects and then I'm going to have Marlene. She's going to pull it all together with all of her wonderful knowledge. So um, an outline of kind of what I'm going to go over today are going to be techniques in vitrification, just kind of a couple of options, understanding the differences between uh, the different protocols that are out there. Go over a little bit of witnessing, how, how you should be or, or hopefully are witnessing in your laboratory. Um, storage management, which is a huge topic in and of itself and probably a huge headache for, for many of us. So we'll, we're going to touch on that. And then I'm going to also talk about um, a policy for discarding donation of tissue. So starting with all the different vitrification protocols that are out there, um, I think the most common ones I kind of have up here on the screen. I think the most important thing you need to understand here is that you understand the similarities as well as the differences between these medias. Obviously, we know all of these are, you know, when we're freezing, they are increasing concentrations of intracellular and extracellular uh, sugar molecules. And then when we're, when we're thawing, warming, it's, it's a decreasing concentration of those large sugar molecules that, that are extracellular. Um, and I know a lot of us are like, oh, it doesn't matter. There's not a big difference. But, you know, some of these protocols are, are very specific to um, the type of device you're using and the timing that you're using. So you want to make sure that you're following your protocol for the specific media that you use to a T and make sure that you're not crossing over. I know some people use multiple medias in their lab. We're shipping and receiving embryos all the time. And um, some labs will go ahead and use their same thaw protocol regardless of how they were frozen and i think that's fine i think most of the warmings are basically a sucrose um, molecule one molar to half molar to zero molar decreasing um, concentration which regardless of how they're frozen those embryos do tend to survive fairly well um, but if your protocol in your laboratory is to match the thaw method to the freeze method you have to make sure that you have all of these different um, medias in your laboratory and understand the devices and how those are used um, again devices they're all over the board as far as um, closed versus open i think sometimes people get a little confused because some of these devices are fda approved as a closed device but in the laboratory, we're not actually using them as a closed device. So if it's truly a closed device, it needs to be sealed before we submerge it in liquid nitrogen. Um, so some of these devices like the CryoTop, the CryoLock, the CryoTech, I have not seen a laboratory that actually seals those devices before they actually submerge them in liquid. Typically we dunk it, wave it around, and then cap it after it's been submerged in the liquid nitrogen. That makes it an open device, not a closed device. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're using a device thinking it's closed, that you're using it truly the closed way. Um, so uh, one thing Nabil wanted us to talk about was egg vitrification versus embryos. And let me move myself off the screen here. Um, 
So why are eggs and embryos different? Um, I think it's important to understand that eggs are the largest cell in the body and therefore they're one of the most difficult cells to freeze in the body. Um, it's the smaller the cell, the easier it is to dehydrate and survive the freezing process because we're gonna decrease any um, ice crystal formation or anything like that. Um, eggs need a more gradual introduction into that ES solution or, the, your, or your, you know, if it's not ES that you're using those first initial concentrations of, of sugar that they're exposed to. Um, typically this, this happens what in the aspect of merging your drops or slowly adding ES little bit by little bit to an existing drop of, of a heaps buffer or a mops buffer media. Typically, we'll slowly add it from 50% to 75% to 100% versus when we're freezing embryos, we're going to put those embryos directly into 100% ES right off the bat. And those embryos recover very quickly. Those cells are very small. They um, equilibrate um, much quicker than the egg does. So I have a little kind of picture here of what the egg looks like as we drop it into ES. So in the beginning, it's, it's fully expanded egg. After about a minute in ES, you can see it's really kind of reacting and trying to equilibrate with the sugar solutions that are crossing the membrane into that egg. And it, to, it initially is going to shrink down and, and look pretty horrible, but then it starts to recover after two, three, and four minutes in ES. And after about five minutes, you're going to see that that egg is fully re-expanded and ready to be moved into the VS solution. And this is one thing when I'm training people is, yes, you need to know your protocol and yes, you need to follow your protocol, but you also can't be a robot. If you look at your eggs when your timer's gone off and it's ready to go into VS, make sure that that egg is actually fully re-expanded to its original size and it's not still recovering because if it's still recovering, it's not quite ready to go into VS. It might need another minute. So use your brain and know what's supposed to be happening when these eggs are in ES, that it's originally gonna shrink, then it's gonna re-expand. If it's not fully re-expanded and looking like a beautiful egg again, by the time your timer's gone off, it might need another minute. Likewise, if you know your timer hasn't gone off and this egg has done what it's supposed to do, and you know if your protocol is eight minutes, I suggest waiting your eight minutes. However, if your egg is fully re-expanded at six minutes, it's technically ready to go into VS and do its thing. So the goal of that ES solution is for it to dehydrate and equilibrate before it goes into VS. Um, not all eggs are the same. So that's that's kind of my point there is some eggs need a little more time. And, and just because your timer went off doesn't mean you should go ahead and move it because my protocol says this, the timer went off, I'm a robot, and I'm doing it. I want the embryologist to actually use their brain. Um, the egg must have the experience of a blood cell once it's gone into VS. So in VS, it starts to really shrink down because in VS, it's just there's very high concentrations of extracellular um, sugar molecules, whether it be sucrose, cellulose, triolose, you know, different companies are going to use a different large sugar molecule, but those are all large sugar molecules that aren't crossing the membrane that are causing that egg to ultimately shrink down so that it can vitrify appropriately. I always tell people your egg should look like a blood cell. It's going to shrink and then it's going to have a little kind of becomes concave. So you want to see that before you plunge your egg into liquid nitrogen. Um, loading, I think, is very crucial. This is something I spend a lot of time on when I'm training embryologists is making sure that you're loading a very, very minimal amount of media onto your device. And again, I, I'm not particular from one device to another, whether it's Cryolock, Cryotech, Cryotop, RapidEye, all these devices are amazing. And I think they do a very good job. But um, it's the embryologist that's loading that device that's very, very important. And you want to make sure that you have the most rapid cooling rate possible. And the only way you're going to have a very rapid cooling rate is if you have a very minimal amount of media on there. Um, in the different techniques that are out there, which I'm a firm believer of the igloos or the dots, we call it the dot, dot, dot technique, where you just drop teeny tiny dots, less than 0.1 microliter onto your device. And if it has to be multiple dots and your embryo doesn't come out till the second or the third dot, fine, doesn't matter. 
Um, you obviously don't want it too high up on your device, but it's going to be less than 0.1 microliter. So what I usually, when I'm training is I have people pull up one microliter, spit it out, pick it up with your stripper tip, and you should be able to make 10 drops with your stripper tip to have that device loaded properly. 10 drops out of that one microliter so that you know what 0.1 microliter is, because it's kind of hard to visualize what is 0.1 microliter. It's really stinking tiny. So that's, that's a way to kind of figure out what size that is. Um, when you do your thaws with this igloo or dot technique, you don't, your device, um, your embryo does not stick to your device. So it floats right off when you do your thaw. Um, another technique that some labs use is the dragging technique, which is where they kind of make a drop and then just kind of drag it out to thin out the amount of media that's between the embryo and the, the ultimate liquid nitrogen. Um, again, this, this is a less than 0.1 microliter, but you, it's, it's increasing the surface tension on your embryo, and it's very variable when you see different embryologists using this technique. Sometimes they drag it out really thin, and it's almost like it's been sucked off, um, and other people leave a giant amount of media on there. So, so that I like to try to at least find some consistency, but if it's done properly, it does have a very rapid cooling rate and very good success as well. Um, the sucking off technique is one that's sort of debatable. I don't encourage people to, to do the sucking off. You can see here, it almost looks like a pimple where the embryo is literally above the surface of the, of the media because we've sucked it off and the, the embryo is sort of stuck on the device at this point. Very, very minimal amount of media, super rapid cooling rate, which is the goal. But um, I do find, especially with hatching embryos and fully hatched embryos, there's a potential embryo if you're going to suck all the media off. The embryos, the eggs, you can get to the device that thaw, and sometimes people have a little trouble getting them to, to come off within that one minute that they're in that TS solution. So um, I would definitely pay attention to what the other embryologists are doing, what your survival rates are, and look at you know what types of loading and how much exactly are people loading on the devices because as I've gone from lab to lab, I see a lot of variability in the volume of media that's going on to these devices. So um, I think it would be very beneficial to all labs to, to compare how much are we putting on the device. Um, so a few vitrification key points um, that I try to tell people is uh, don't plunge into liquid nitrogen too soon. I know people set their timer for a minute or uh, you know anywhere from 45 to a minute and a half, um, and people get a little excited and, and might plunge too soon. But you need your embryo or your egg to actually equilibrate in that BS in that minute. So, so time to do that. Um, make sure there's equilibration both in the ES and in the BS. So you want to see the embryo or egg shrink and re-expand in the ES. And then when you put it in VS, the egg, you want to see shrink down and look like a blood cell. The embryo, you want to see it kind of fold in half and kind of form a half moon or, or really shrink down. Um, so you see it responding to that VS solution. And, and for me, when I'm freezing, if I don't see it shrinking, I give it a little more time. I don't just plunge it because my timer went off. I make sure that there's actual equilibration in that VS. Again, use your head. Don't be a robot. Pay attention to what's actually happening and make sure that it's actually happening. Every embryo and every egg is not the same. Um, again, minimal media on your device. You want to monitor your stats and look for trends. So make sure that you're looking at, gee, you know, we had some poor survival. We had poor implantation here and there. Let's look at, you know, was there a difference in who was doing the thaw, who did the freeze, and try to make sure not to not to point out that somebody's doing something wrong, but something uh, to make everybody better and more uniform in your lab. Um, talk to your colleagues. We're, we're all here to support you. I love the embryology field because I do feel like I can call anyone anytime and say, hey, there's an issue here. What are you guys doing? Can you help me? Um, we're, we're on a level of all of us are here to, to make our industry better. So feel free to call people, call me. Um, warming key points. Um, I always tell people to warm their TS overnight. 
Um, I feel like sometimes in the morning things get rushed and people forget to put the TS in the warmer. Um, we put it in in the afternoon before we leave. And then right when we get in the morning, you can pull it out and go to town. Um, make sure you use the full volume for your TS. Um, this is a crucial step. So if your protocol says to use two mils, use two mils. If it says to use 50, use 50. But um, make sure you're paying attention to exactly what your protocol is and not just what someone else in the lab is, is doing. Um, and don't cut corners. This vitrification and warming is, is so particular and so important. You don't want to try to make any shortcuts here. Okay, so moving on to witnessing. Um, the steps that I typically would be witnessing in a laboratory would be receipt of sperm, any tube transfers while you're washing the sperm or freezing the sperm. Um, egg retrieval would be a patient check with dish check that they're going into. Stripping when you're moving from one dish to another and then also when you're moving into culture. We witness at um, ICSI or insemination, all dish changes. Moving your embryos back to culture post biopsy. And this is the first time where you start actually witnessing not only the patient's name, but also the individual numbers. So when we're performing a, a witness up to this point, we have both verbal and visual witness. So it's kind of like a timeout. And the embryologist says, I'm moving, um, you know, Joe Blow's sperm from, you know, the specimen cup to first wash or onto the gradient. And the embryologist that's witnessing it says, yes, this is Joe Blow. Their gradient tube says Joe Blow. So no pun intended there. So um, individual numbers would be one is going into drop one, two is going into drop two, and it's a verbal. Both embryologists are verbally saying this as well. Um, moving the biopsy cells into the tubes, freezing up embryos is a little bit more detailed because you're not only checking the label of the straws, and the paperwork, but you're also checking that as the embryos are going from the culture dish into the ES, and then also, again, as you're loading onto the device. So there should be multiple um, initials for a freeze um, witness, one when it enters ES and one when it goes from VS onto the device. At thaw, again, a lot, a lot of things to check, but we usually check the PGT results, the patient consent, the doctor's order, the schedule for the day, because sometimes the patient gets canceled for some reason, we thaw an embryo and there isn't even an embryo transfer, um, the cryo record, and the device label, and then the dish that it's going into. So a lot of things to check at a thaw. And then ET uh, into the dish and the patient confirmation. And again, if you're not doing all these things, it's not necessarily a very solid witnessing program if you're only witnessing part of the stuff, okay? So your witness protocol must be solid and complete. Um, what do you do on weekends? If you have a solo embryologist, there should be a plan in place. We usually train on um, our medical assistants or our nurses or even our doctors at some times to come in and be a witness, but we never skip those witness steps. So you should have some sort of plan. We do also, um, I've been in laboratories where they will um, do uh, FaceTime or photos, again, HIPAA gets to be a big deal here, but I did talk to a HIPAA agent at one point that said, as long as it's in a locked chat group that's pass-coded, you can send patient information. I'm not a HIPAA expert though, so don't quote me on that, but something to look into if solo embryologist is an issue for you guys. Um, something else to help cover the solo embryologist is electronic witnessing. Um, the RI witness, the matcher, and the Gidget are all out there on the market now and, and great options for um, having a solo embryologist when you're doing an ICSI or an embryo transfer. Um, and then if you skip one witnessing step, you may as well skip them all. You, you can't say we have a witnessing program, but we don't witness this and that. You can try to go to a, a court and tell a judge that you witnessed everything except one step, then they're gonna say, well, that's <laughs> your fault, it's, it's pointless to not have a solid, a rock solid witnessing system. Um, storage man management, I think most of us would agree is a huge headache 
for all of us. Um, R helps um, and an Excel spreadsheet helps, but we often have these missed entries where paperwork gets shuffled, paperwork gets filed before it got entered, and we have mistakes where, you know, so-and-so patient called and they asked how many embryos they have, but only the day five embryos were entered and the day six embryos weren't. The patient thought they had seven. We're telling them they have four because that's what's in the spreadsheet and there's uh, chaos from, from the patient. So that's horrible. And then also inventory mistakes. Obviously, we've all been there where we've done cryo inventory and you know, the one that's not in here, you know, it's in there somewhere, but it's not in the tank or the canister that we thought it was. Typically, that's some sort of dyslexic mistake by the embryologist where you put it in tank two, canister four, instead of tank four, canister four. Very common mistake to make, but it, it creates chaos in the lab. When you go to do a thaw and you can't find something or a patient is, is there wanting to transfer embryos and, and they're not there. Um, it gives us little mini heart attacks. So um, the tomorrow tank is, is I think, something that's on the horizon that is going to help us a lot because you can't put anything in the tank without it being recorded. So there's no missed entries. Um, and it's, it's real-time automated inventory control. So you don't have to be doing inventory. It's there. It's real. What's in there is 100% there. And we don't have any of our dyslexic mistakes. So on the horizon, that is going to be saving a lot of headaches for us as embryologists. Um, but in the meantime, we need to have a better system to get our EMR and our Excel spreadsheets updated more accurately. And Lord help me. I don't know. I don't know what to do with that one. Um, Again, there's a lot more that goes into storage management, you know, alarming and monitoring of the tanks. I think um, Marlene might be talking about that, but um, that's, that's a whole nother ball game. So I'm going to leave it there for storage management. Um, and then policy for discard and donation. I know this varies a lot from lab to lab and it can, and that's fine. Um, but I'm just going to kind of throw out my idea of what I've done in the past that has worked pretty well. Um, obviously, having um, things written in your cryo consents up front is, is the best situation. Um, addressing abandoned embryos, non-payment, and all the dispositions, which I think most consents these days are good to go. The problem is our consents from 10, 15, or 20 years ago weren't very good, and we still have those embryos sitting in the tanks, not knowing what to do with them because we didn't have our consents up to par. Um, I think most of us to some degree follow the ASRM guidelines, um, which is, you know, if there's five years with no contact and we've had three attempts to contact the patient, including a certified letter, we can discard their tissue. I know a lot of us say we're following this protocol, but we don't actually discard the tissue because we're afraid. Um, you need to be careful though, because you can get sued for not discarding tissue if you say that you're going to. So if they sign a consent, saying that we follow the ASRM guidelines and if we don't hear from them or they don't pay for five years and we've tried to contact them um, and we're supposed to discard their tissue, but then we, we email them 10 years later and say, we still have your embryos, they can sue you for not following your protocol. And people have won in the past for that. I think Susan Crokin has talked about that. Um, so you need to be careful that your consent say that you may discard the embryos and not necessarily that you will. Um, that might be a little play on the word, but it might protect you a little bit. Um, your consent to discard, so patients that have had tissue and stored for a while, um, it gets a little hairy having them sign and notarize. I know patients a lot of times don't want to notarize. They have all these excuses as to why they can't notarize. We are pretty good sticklers just that you have to notarize it. Um, the problem is for international how do you track these people? How do you, you know, they, they don't have notaries in other countries. So you have to have some sort of plan for how the international people can still consent to discard their tissue. Typically, that would be some sort of a copy of your passport ID with a letter that's signed by you saying you want um, your, your tissue discarded. We typically wait about three months after we get these consents in case the patient calls back two weeks later, which this has happened many a time, saying that they've changed their mind and they, they signed it, they notarized it, and now they don't want to do it. 
So we usually hold off. We also have two embryologists go through and approve the discard, not only at the time of discard, but prior to discard, confirming that we have the right chart with the right paperwork and all the birthdays and IDs match up. Um, and the, um, that we do have the embryos and or sperm on hand. And then we also do make sure that they've actually delivered their baby. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll sign these discard consents when they're two months pregnant. And if they miscarry and we've just discarded their embryos, it, it could be sort of a crisis. So some of them might be a little overconfident. So we usually wait until they actually delivered their baby before we're gonna discard their tissue. So we'll just hold it in one of the many piles in the embryology lab of tissue to be discarded, but we're waiting on it until they deliver their baby. Um, and then just confirming what type of option they've chosen. Is it a discard? Is it a donation? Is it a research and training? You know, make sure that you're, you're doing the right thing with the with embryos and the sperm. And then it all happens with a, obviously a double witness to embryologists um, confirming all of the paperwork and the straws are matching. All right, so that's that. Um, if you have any questions, my email, my phone number are right there on the slide. You're welcome to call me and contact me anytime. I'm happy to talk embryology all day and all night. Um, Marlene, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thanks, Debbie. All right, so over the years, I think the bottom line is we've probably used every solution that's out there on the market. Um, I started many years ago, like back in 2005, training people on um, Irvine's original kits and their cryo tips. And we used Irvine and cryo tips for probably 10 years. Uh, we also tried vitro life's kits with uh, rapid eye. We've tried cryotech with cryo tops. We've tried kitazato with cryo locks and the, the kitazato uh, device that's very similar to the cryo top. And we've used every possible cross combination that's out there. I think, you know, Irvine Media with just about every device. And generally, I think we've seen very minimal differences in outcomes. Um, there have been a couple of reports from some of my labs. I direct five labs over, but have directed several over the years, usually as an offsite. And there have been some times in some labs where they found that something was not working particularly well, but generally, you know, I think once you get used to a particular device, um, it's, it's pretty, especially with embryos, I think vitrification has truly changed how we, how we freeze and what we freeze. And we've made that, that switch from doing pro-nuclear freezes or day three freezes to doing blastocysts. And just because we've had such great success. I think there's a lot of drivers to how you decide on which kit or which which device you're going to use. I think cost is a huge driver for most of us. Um, for me, I think it's it's experience and comfort of my staff. Um, it, and so I think it generally comes down to personal preference. And I haven't seen one device that I think is is outstanding. Some of them I think are are harder to get into. So like once the, the device is locked down, it can be difficult to, to unlock. Um, and we have had some problems in shipping with some of these platform devices like the Kitazato or the Cryotech. Um, we've received devices from other programs where the, the paddle part has been broken off the, the handle, um, empty devices. And, you know, I had somebody once accuse me of, not putting uh, embryos up into the cryo tip. And, you know, I know what happened there. I know that person didn't thaw them or warm the cryo tip correctly uh, because I've seen it happen in, to many, many people during training sessions. And so all of these devices take training. And I, I can't emphasize that often enough that whatever you, device your lab director has decided to use or you choose to use if you're the lab director it's 
practice, 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 practice. And I just don't think you can practice enough before you really start to use this on, on human oocytes or embryos. And we certainly found even after years and years of doing embryo cryo that it was different with oocyte cryo. So I just think it's critical to, to get the details down pat. So in terms of solutions, which ones do I use? I like the Kitazato or Cryotech solutions. I think you get fewer bubbles. The, they really, you know, Masa really changed those solution formulations a few years back. Um, took out the sucrose, put in the trailose, took out the protein, put in the, the methyl cellulose. And I think it's made for a thicker solution, but really with many, many fewer bubbles. And I like it a lot. The biggest problem we've had recently, though, is that cryotech solutions are not FDA cleared and are not readily available. And one of my labs has not had good luck with the cryotech, I'll call it knockoff solutions, um, that are being made, I, as I understand it, by someone from Masa's lab. So they're familiar with what the formulation is, but there's just, it has not worked well in that lab's hands. So we've moved away from Cryotech and primarily using Kitazato. And I have two labs that have been using Irvine's most recent formulation with good success and are very happy with that. So I don't have I really think that a lot of this is what you're used to and what you you develop the feel for. Because I have someone who really dislikes the Kitazato solutions because they're so thick. And I have other people that love them because they don't get bubbles. So it's what you're used to. Devices, um, I like the Cryolock or, or Vitrigard. We have spent, well, I have not, but one of my texts, uh, Devin Monahan at Laurel Fertility has spent a lot of time trying to knock embryos off that device. I mean, literally, he's throwing the tips against the back of the hood. He's throwing them down on the floor, pretty much done throwing them against the wall, knocked them on the countertop and has not been able to dislodge embryos from that. Unlike what we have not had a similar success like that with the, the cryotech devices. I think there's something about that curve, the sort of scoop to the cryolock and the vitrigard that changed the surface tension enough that it holds samples onto the device better. But I think it's also probably the techniques that Debbie talked about in terms of how you add your, your embryo or your oocyte to the, the device. We use a technique that was very similar to what Debbie um, described that I learned from uh, Brian Lamanto at the World Egg Bank, and he calls it the tap technique. So basically you load, like if this is your, your stripper tip, you load the embryo right down there to the tip, and then this is your paddle, and it's just touch, touch, touch up the, the paddle. And each touch, you get capillary action that's going to pull a little bit of solution right out of the bottom of your stripper tip. And so by the time, probably in most cases, by the time you get to that third touch, it's the embryo is down on the cryo top, uh, top or the cryo lock. And you don't have to depress the plunger at all. So we primarily use cryo locks or, or vitro, um, vitro, vitro guards because the samples seem to stick pretty well when transporting. All right. Um, so this might be a place where Debbie and I dis disagree a little bit. Um, I really do think you can mix and match VIT and warming kits, primarily because of what Debbie mentioned, which is that in essence, the warming kits, the only thing that really differs from warming kit to warming kit is going to be the basal media formulation and uh, possibly the... Um, the buffer system. You know, some people use mop, some people use heaps. I we've had um, several students that have tried to look at this. One master student from one of my labs did a comparison between embryos that were vitrified with Irvine solutions in cryotips and versus vitrolife solutions in cryotips. 
and so did a, a mix and match. And then he did the reverse where he took rapid eyes and did them in Irvine solutions and rapid eyes and did them in vitro life solutions. We picked those two because they were as different as we could get at the time in terms of solutions. You know, the vitro life solutions are very different. Um, they have propane dial, or uh, I don't even remember at the moment, but the solutions are different or were different, at least the sucrose, the buffers, the, um, and the basal formulations were all different between those three solutions. But the thing that's consistent about them is that stepwise decrease of uh, cryoprotectant. So we, we did this sort of box cross study and he found no difference in uh, survival rates when embryos were vitrified in either a cryo tip or a rapid eye using Irvine solutions or vitro life solutions. Another master's student from EVS has tried using Irvine warming kits, uh, the, their, their most, most recent, recent iteration of warming kits for slow cooled embryos. So some of these old embryos that we always used to use sage, slow thaw or thaw solution Universal thaw solution, I think is what it was called. It hasn't been around for several years. But we used to always use that for anything that was older and had been slow cooled. Or I mean, um, yeah, run through the, the program freezer. And it worked just fine. So this student tried using Irvine's warming kits for slow cooled embryos, and it worked fine. She compared them to vitrified embryos that had been vitrified and warmed in Irvine media versus vitrified embryos that had been warmed using or slow cooled embryos that were warm in Irvine solutions. And it just all seemed to be fine. The only one we've really had a problem with is, you know, I think there was a time probably 10 years ago or so where there was a lot of sort of in-house development of media that was going on where people were sort of playing, it was a tough time when we went from doing slow cooling and it cost us pennies to make our own media, which most of us did, to using these kits that were a lot more expensive. And I think people played around a lot with making their own solutions. And the biggest problem we've encountered is that we got a group of samples from someone who had been doing large volume rapid freezing. So it was sort of a variant on Jim Stachecki's method that was done in quarter cc straws, but was in essence a slow version of, of vitrification. We have just not had good luck with those, but we also got very little documentation for how the, the samples were frozen, mostly because I think they were doing a lot of development and a lot of making a lot of changes. And so we've had a difficult time replicating that. The only thing that we really don't accept, um, because I worked with Irvine Solutions for a lot of years, I've used cryo tips, very comfortable with those. I know a lot of people don't accept cryo tips, but the one thing I really don't want to get are cryo loops. Um, I just never felt like I developed the skill for that. And I think they're I think we've had poor survival with those. They're hard to use without blowing bubbles, especially with those cryo loops that are the kind where you had to glue on the little, the little peg to the top. And it's that peg is hollow. And if you dunk it too far into the solution, you're gonna blow bubbles. And it's just, it was a horrible pain. So I really will not accept cryo loops. Um, as the, the cryo device. I would take I would take quarter cc straws. I would even take glass ampules once I went out and found a, a diamond uh, tipped etcher to get into them. But there's not much I wouldn't accept except for cryo loops. Um, we liked the cryo tip and had very, very good success with the cryo tip, but it's it's a fussy little device and we stopped using them because we went through several techs in a, a cor the course of a few years. And even though we thought we had these techs well-trained in this, there's just enough fussiness to the cryo tip that you have to have different settings for the, the small end versus the large end. And we had problems with the, the cryo tips blowing up. And if you've ever had one, it's, it's, a, 
it's quite an exciting moment when one blows up on you. <laughs> one I choose not to repeat. I'm getting too old for this heart stopping adrenaline boy, because it's it's they blow with a a huge bang. And so what we started doing in order to to deal with that, you know, initially the cryotips were warmed in water, and we moved to warming cryotips in media that had some protein in it. So if that device blew up, at least it was contained within the, the media. And we we were able to recover some, but it happened frequently. And I'm saying, you know, like maybe one time a year, but you know, they're memorable events. And so we ended up moving away from using cryotips. But if anyone gets some cryotips and has not used them before, please, please get a hold of me because I have a very detailed protocol or how to use and, and what to use. And so what some of the tips and tricks are for warming a cryotip. One of the biggest ones is you need a really good, thin, sharp pair of scissors. You need to make sure that you get one of those adapters. Irvine no longer makes them, but they have them. They'll be expired, but you know, you're know, nothing's gonna touch that adapter anyway. And ideally, um, a glass 250 microliter Hamilton syringe. Those are the, the keys to getting good survival from the cryotips. Um, I will accept embryos, but some of my labs won't, which I understand. Um, open versus closed systems. I've really seen no difference in open systems. And I agree with Debbie. Most of us use things that are supposedly closed systems, but we use them like they're open systems. The only one I know that's really truly being used as a, a closed system would be the rapid eye. Um, Janine Whitmire at George Washington um, in DC has used cryotips for oocytes with good success for many, many, many years. And I think people have argued that you really need an open system for oocytes. And the cryotips very definitely a closed device. Um, so I just, I really have not been convinced by the data that shows that an open device is better for oocytes than a closed. I certainly haven't seen any data to support differences in open versus closed devices for embryos. And I think most people these days use some form of what we, most of us would, I think, refer to as a modified open device where um, you put the cap on under, like Debbie was discussing, but generally, I, I think there are very few people using a true, truly closed device anymore. I think the biggest problem for oocytes is shipping. Um, I just remain absolutely convinced that shipping can cause problems, bigger problems for oocytes than embryos. Um, but that's, you know, that's just a, a gut. That is no, I have seen no good data. Um, I've talked, several people and I have talked about setting up a shipping process where we ship donated oocytes around the country and, and see if it matters versus things that weren't shipped. And I think there was one paper out there, maybe that came out of Mike Reed's lab a few years ago, where they, they tried to look at that and didn't see a difference. But I'm not sure if they were looking at oocytes or embryos there. Um, I just think oocytes in general are a little less hardy. I think embryos are very hardy. And I think they handle the shipping pretty well. They, they handle you know, differences in handling very well. So I think embryos are pretty good. What we're finding now in an attempt to try to get away from this issue associated with oocytes is we're doing more and more embryo creation through donor egg banks. I think they're all offering that these days. So rather than having oocytes running around the country in shippers, and, you know, I've had some just really horrible shipper events happen. They're not frequent, but, you know, if you even have one of them, it's awful. Um, I was involved as an expert witness in a shipping lawsuit that, you know, I felt very sorry for the, for all parties involved in this in this shipping lawsuit, it went on for nine years. And it was embryos from a donor, uh, a set of donor eggs that were donated to someone as embryos. And those embryos were shipped from one state to another and the shipper arrived warm and all the embryos were lost. And 
you know, as I went back through all of the, the paperwork, which was boxes and boxes of paperwork, it really looked like the company that like the, the people who QC'd their shipper, loaded their shipper and sent it, did pretty much everything right. There was, I, I just didn't see any big holes. There was some problems on the shipping documentation. They didn't rate, they didn't actually weigh their shipper. Um, but other than that, uh, I thought they did a, a very nice job. But, you know, if you go back in and you read the fine print in the FedEx website, and I don't know if it's off, I haven't read it in a couple of years, but FedEx says they don't accept embryos or oocytes for shipping. So any of us that are shipping via FedEx and uh, UPS are, in essence, setting ourselves up for potential problems because UPS and FedEx are well protected under the law. They will, um, they were cut out of this lawsuit. They had no involvement in it whatsoever because their lawyers said, this is shipper beware. Um, and that the shipping company itself that handles the shippers has no responsibility. And during the deposition, it was quite interesting because the FedEx employees basically said, doesn't matter what you put on the outside of that box. You can say, you can have every arrow in the world saying this end up, handle, fragile, blah, 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 was essentially what they said, is that they're gonna put it whatever way works for them on their truck and we have there's nothing we can say, nothing we can do, no way we can label that container that will make them change their behavior. So, you know, that lawsuit went on for many, many years, and it had to have been extremely expensive to all parties. And it was settled the day before. Uh, in fact, I was at the airport getting ready to get on a plane to go testify, and they they settled out of court, but that had to have been, I mean, when looking at the hours, my deposition was five hours. And so just looking at the boxes of paperwork that came through, there must have been a lot of money spent in lawyers. So based on that, we just decided we're not going to ship, we'll receive, we're not going to ship. Um, and we have moved to doing um, uh, embryo creation at the egg banks. So they create the, we will ship them sperm. All the shipping companies out there, UPS and FedEx will allow you to ship sperm. The thing is they don't ask what's in the tank. So it doesn't really matter. But if you are at least protected because their websites will say you can ship. Um, so we will ship sperm to a donor egg bank let them create the embryos and then they can ship them back to us. And they, they seem to, I, I like the way embryos handle shipping much better than I like the way oocytes handle shipping. As far as storage, I think the best system I've seen is the one at the University of Wisconsin, which I had absolutely nothing to do with in terms of setting up, it was set up by Jeff Jones. And it was, it was a reaction to an event about three years ago, I think, where they came, the water came this close to flooding. It was a really, really wet spring. And it came that close to flooding the embryology lab. And everyone was in a, a real panic about that. So they set up this very nice system where every tank is in its little box. Every tank is on a scale. Every scale is monitored and alarmed. All of the tanks have internal alarms there. It's all, it's all um, on a nice readout. Everything is read every day, both the weight of the tank and the, the probes that are in the tank. I like alarms that have probes inside and then the temperature probe also on the outside, we use temp alert in several of my labs. And I like that system because the temp alert box has a thermometer on it or in it also. So you can turn the, the temp alert box on that sits on the outside of your shipper. And so you can get a reading from the probe that's inside and a reading on the probe, essentially on the probe that's attached to the outside. So I think some of the studies, I'm sure people have seen a lot of studies recently, looking at what happens when tanks fail. And one of the very first things you start to see 
is accumulation of frost and ice on the outside of your tank. So the inside probe measures tanks that are warming. The outside probe measures tanks that are cooling on the outside. So you get like a, for the cost of one system, you get double protection there. Um, the other thing I've seen people doing that I just really don't understand is the temperatures on their probes are set to alarm it, what I consider to be way too high um, a temperature. And so if you put your probe in, so it sits at the bottom of the tank, and you have some sort of device like a sensophone where the, the temp alert uh, temperature is minus 150, if the temperature hits minus 150 and is picked up by your probe that's at the bottom of your tank, it means that your tank is within minutes of completely warming. That's too little, too late. You're never going to get there because you know, these tanks never fail at, at three o'clock in the afternoon. They only fail at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, how many times have we all had alarms that are going off at, at three o'clock in the morning? And so somebody has to get up and come in. You're just, that's just what you have to do. But we set our probes high in the tank. So we, the problem there is every time you open the lid, the damn alarm goes off. But that's much better than having an alarm that goes off too late. I think there was a report that Kim Pomeroy and several people did that showed if your tank gets to minus 150, you've got about 10 minutes before that temperature is going to get above that devitrification temperature of minus 130. And so unless you live right next door to your lab, nobody's getting in in that period of time and you're going to lose samples. So we set the probes near the top of the canister. We set the alert for the internal probe at minus 187. And because when tanks fail, they fail fast. So I wanna know as far in advance as possible. So I think a better option to all of this. I mean, we did look into tomorrow tanks like Debbie suggested. And the problem is in one of my labs here in San Francisco, that tank won't even fit. We don't have a shipping elevator. We just have a, a regular people elevator. And we, we can't get the tomorrow tank into our elevator. There's not a, a high enough clearance in our elevator. And we haven't been willing to pop out a window on the fifth floor yet and get a you know, a cherry picker up here to load that tank into the, the, into the center. So um, I keep hearing that tomorrow is going to make a smaller tank. I just haven't seen it yet. So the other option is, um, you know, every place I go is wrestling with tanks. You know, we've got tanks coming out our ears. We have right now there are problems getting tanks. Um, we're using up all of our reserve tanks and we can't get new ones, so we can't get a, a backup system. So if something fails, we're, we're in trouble and I lose a lot of sleep over this. So what we've started doing is we've set up, uh, at least in Wisconsin, and we're setting up in uh, Carolinas and we're setting it up here in California, is that we're getting ready to start automatically shipping samples out to a biorepository. And um, so with all of our embryos, we have a one year ship date. It's an automatic transfer. People sign that consent and get registered with ReProtect before their retrieval. If we get, if we're freezing oocytes, we're gonna get them off to the bio repository as soon as the retrieval's over and we've got them frozen down. Same thing with sperm. As soon as sperm are collected, we get them off. We also get any of our cancer patients connected with Live Strong um, and Verna's Purse. So we get as much help for them as, as they can get for coverage of storage. It's painful to set up and to initially get everyone on board with and to get the consents and get the process in place. But hopefully it's going to be um, effective in the end. Um, so like I said, oocytes go out immediately, embryos go out in a year. And in order to really expedite this, we've hired at least one new staff person to manage because this is a lot of shipping, a lot of shipping in, a lot of shipping out. But um, hopefully in the long run, it's going to save us. It's going to reduce our risk. 
and save us money on the back end. The other thing that we've done, um, let me back up here just a minute. The other thing we've done is years ago, we set up, um, you know, it's always a problem tracking patients down who have just abandoned their samples. And in most cases, they do it just simply because they're ambivalent about it. They can't bear to discard them, but they can't bear to, you know, they don't want to continue paying. So one of the things we did is we upped the cost of storage to make it very uncomfortable for patients. Um, after five years, we haven't heard from anyone for five years, uh, the billing goes up to $5,000 a year. And um, one of my lawyers called that obscene. And it was like, oh, well, I agree, it is obscene, but the point is to get them out of here, to try to do something to help patients resolve the conflict and to address the issues that, that they've been ignoring for several years. Um, so we've also instituted that in the last recent, in the last year in Wisconsin, we've had it here in California for a long time. And you know, anything we can do to try to reduce our risk from having multiple tanks on site. And I've been in places where I've seen 30 or 40 tanks and I would have more sleepless nights than I already have if I had that many tanks. So the only way, you know, we've tried everything I know of, um, EMRs, Excel spreadsheets, handwritten databases, logs, log books, um, nothing works for exactly, exactly the reasons Debbie talked about is that we're all human and we forget. It's easy to forget that you ship something out. It's easy to forget that you receive something. It's easy to transpose numbers. Um, it's just generally, it's all bad. I will admit I have not used the tomorrow system, so I don't know how well that works. But with the updates that Ideas has done, um, I've seen, you know, I really like the Ideas system for cryotank management. If you take it in and put it out correctly, you get a very nice uh, report that tells you exactly what's in your, your tanks. And I think Excel, you know, because many of us are using EMRs, especially if you're in a university and you have to use Epic, there is nothing embryology friendly about Epic as an EMR. Uh, it is useless. It's probably less than useless. If I was giving it a stars, I would give it minus a hundred stars. It's just awful for anything having to do with, with cryotank management. Um, there, it's just useless. So we've done some investigating on trying to set up some of these EMRs where even if you have another existing EMR, because nobody in the clinic wants to change their EMR, but um, at least bringing in the laboratory portion of it to try to help manage, especially manage the, the cryo logistics. To me, a, a good EMR is gonna justify the cost of that. Um, and especially if the EMR will do inventory, cryo inventory well, do billing and do data dumps to start, I would pay almost any amount of money to justify that. Um, so the bottom line for me is that, as far as I'm concerned, any person doing cryo needs training. There was a nice study that came out several years ago. I can't remember the first author's name on it. But they demonstrated that you need at least 40 documented uh, vitrifications and about 40 documented warmings before they could really look at the incidences that occurred during vitrification and warming and feel that the, the technician had really mastered the training. So I think we all tend to bring in our, our newbies and get them started fairly early on things like retrievals and freezing. And you know, once, once you have someone that you feel really can handle embryos well, it seems like a pretty reasonable step. Um, but I really do think we need to be very careful that we've got, we've documented those 40 to 50 bits and warmings 
quite well. Um, I think solutions and devices are pretty interchangeable. I, I, in all my labs, I pretty much let people use what's comfortable for them. Cryo tank management continues to give me sleepless nights. Um, I'm, I'd be very happy to have a better solution. And my what I've learned from the University of Wisconsin is that um, I think the solution that has worked best for us is to find the most anal OCD person in your lab and put them in charge of cryo management. The EMR or the database shipping and receiving and the billing, sorry if you're that person, but it's really, really time consuming and attention sucking to do cryotank management. So you want the best possible person you can have doing that. And that's it for me. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna start my first question for you guys and maybe starting from the end, which is the use of uh, technology in managing the storage. AMR systems, um, as you said, uh, Marlene, have not been very practical, at least for this particular application. What most people are using currently to manage and document the storage? I think people are primarily using Excel spreadsheets. Um, or, you know, if you have ideas, you can, they've got a, a nice add on. Um, their cryo management system is pretty good. I think the problem is, I don't know that it's necessarily the problem with, I mean, at this point, we're doing it all in, a, in an access database that, you know, the university doesn't want to support anymore, but we're sort of forcing them to until they give us a better option. The whole problem with cryotank management is, is the, the technician behind it. You know, unfortunately, it's who puts things in, who takes things out. Have you, uh, have you done all the paperwork and the data entry associated with that? And I just, you know, I'm hoping that the Tomorrow system will solve that problem. Uh, Debbie Bill uses it, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all automated, so you can't miss that. You can't forget to enter it, or, you know, you can't put two straws in the device, and two devices into the freezer, but only write one. It, it, it controls all those errors that we make in our data entry. Um, it controls that, so there aren't those mistakes. So, that's cool. And you can't mistakenly put it in 2.4 when it's supposed to go in 4.2. It's the machine is putting it away for you. So it, it rules out a lot of those human error mistakes that kill us in the lab. And we spend hours trying to figure out where the heck did someone put those embryos? We know they're in there, but we just don't know. I don't know why, we just thought somebody cut me out, got my photo instead. Um, yeah, we just, we just spend hours looking for stuff when it got put in the wrong spot. And it's, it's so frustrating. Yeah. It's really frustrating. So if we can have any system that's going to solve that, and I don't know, I, I'm <laughs> anytime I've done cryo inventory in a lab, we always have this giant problem list of, okay, this is in the Excel spreadsheet, but it's not in the tank, and these are in the tank, but they're not in the spreadsheet, and then you try to match up all those problems and they don't all match up. And then you're like, okay, what happened? And it's not that there was truly a mistake. It's not like we're throwing things away. They're there, the, the data entry and the, the paper process action just did not line up appropriately. And that's, that's annoying. Totally agree, totally agree. And I have no better solution uh, so that that's awesome. So when it comes to the uh, how okay, this wait, hold on, Bill just had a comment. Yeah. Bill said currently it's to the patient's beacon, the cane or the goblet, goblet to each specimen coming really soon. So what he's saying is right now the machine will bring the whole goblet to you, and then you can put in and out of the goblet what you want. But their next generation machine is going to be to the device. So it's basically a vending machine. You go up to the vending machine, you say you want this person's device number two, and device number two will come to you. 
total vending machine, which is kind of cool. Awesome. So when we look at the evolution of uh, media composition for vitrification, and I think you and Marlene have hinted a little bit on some of those changes, may, uh, for example, changing sucrose for tree hylos and, and mops versus hips. And uh, are these changes in solutions impacting the actual uh, survival rates did you see any benefits or what's the reason behind all these changes that have made were made in this? Uh, I think it's ease of use primarily and trying to get improvements. But, you know, the problem is that most of us have such good survival rates that it's hard to tell if you've provided a benefit. Um, you know, like most of my labs are running, you know, far, probably, 97 percent survival and you know out of that three percent there it's maybe one percent if that maybe half a percent where you don't recover the embryo so it's hard to improve on that two percent i mean it's it's hard to see if you improved it and you know most of us are doing are getting break pregnancy rates. I mean, that's the thing that's driven us to vitrification is our pregnancy rates that are excuse me, so much better than they were when we were doing slow cooling. So I think we're sort of honing this system to the point where it's hard to really track. I haven't seen huge major changes in the vitrification solutions in a long time. Oh, you're back, Debbie. Um, good. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the substitution for trailo, of, sub, of trailos for sucrose makes sense to me uh, intellectually, you know, because it's, the, the, it's a sugar that's, that protects things like frogs from freezing to death over, over the winter. So we know it's found in nature, um, and I, I think that's fine. Um, the methyl cellulose has been substituted by cryotech um, to avoid the whole problem with protein, you know, which is why you get fewer bubbles in your, your solution. Um, and, you know, but Irvine substituted dextran years ago for uh, protein because they couldn't get their solutions into Europe because they're, when they were making their solutions, it was made with SSS and SSS has a component called um, the microglobulin fraction that's really um, a mixture of at least a hundred different proteins and so it's not precisely identified so it, it, they couldn't get their vitrification solution through the, the EU for CE mark so they moved to, to dextran um, and I think something else to look at, Marlene, is we look at survival rates and we're all like high 90s. Yep. But survival rate is the most subjective thing we're looking at. This is embryologists saying, yeah, it survived. And you know as well as I know that what we call survive sometimes it's like, uh, yeah. yes, absolutely. Survive, but it doesn't look amazing. So implantation rates would be a little better. And I think that's what some of these um, newer trilose cellulose raffinose companies are looking more at the, the follow-up of implantation rates and not survival because we all say we're somewhere between 95 and 99.9 percent .9 survival which is kind of insignificant really right um, but our implantation rates are not the same so that's telling us that these embryos aren't surviving at quite the same rate between clinics and between um, vitrification and, and warming protocols as no I, I agree that's definitive you know yeah we have not seen uh, huge differences in pregnancy or implantation rates but i have not i haven't had a student and i have not done a large data assessment of that so yeah. um but ultimately the the goal the purpose is the same those are all large sugar molecules that are their function is the same they, those companies may argue that these these sh large sugar molecules are working in a different or better, more effective way, but it's a large sugar molecule that doesn't cross the membrane. It's allowing your embryo to re-equilibrate back to culture media. So their function 
is the same, but how they function is the debatable point. Yep. Thank you so much. Or if one functions better than another. I mean, I just don't think the, the data is clear on that yet. Right. Yeah. So the other point I wanted to talk about is uh, the question is whether it's common for clinic to use an outside source to store uh, reproductive tissues, oocytes, embryos, etc. Is it something that you would recommend and is it, pro is it common across labs? I'd say it's common, but I think it varies. I think some labs just keep accumulating tanks and, and eventually they're gonna have to do something because the tanks keep growing, <laughs> they're, they're multiplying. Yeah. Um, but I think it's common for a lot of labs to have storage for a certain number of years and then it goes off site. Some labs are super quick, like six months and it's off site, which is awesome. I walked into a giant lab about a year ago to do some per diem work and they had like four tanks in their lab. And I'm like, oh, where's your tank room? <laughs> we don't have a tank room. We get rid of stuff in six months and I was like, this is amazing. Like, it was so easy. It was so easy. Yeah. I, I would go to shipping stuff off immediately if I could. It's just the physicians have a, a small panic attack at the idea of not having embryos immediately available for a patient if they're, if they're not pregnant from their, their fresh or, or first frozen cycle. But, you know, these days, like here in California, we can get, we can get tanks the next day from Reno. Um, and in Wisconsin, we can get tanks the next day from Minnesota. I can drive over and pick up a tank if I need to. Um, so I think, I think it's becoming more frequent, Nabil. Um, I think the biggest reason people don't do it is if they have a really good billing department and they're being very, uh, aggressive about billing, this is, this the is revenue is huge. Yeah. The revenue is yeah. ridiculous. Yep. So for, for very little, I mean, you know, what what does it take? They don't see the time that it takes us to do it. So they think that it's essentially free, except for the cost of the, the liquid nitrogen. Until you get to that event, you know, poor Pacific fertility has found that this is not a cheap event to have right. a tank go down. Um and in terms of liability, is it less liability? Well, the the lawsuit that the first lawsuit that has gone through um, for a, a tank at PFC that blew up, that wasn't their their fault. The tank blew up, and the settlement was fifteen million dollars to split between five patients. Oh. And from what I understand, there's now another civil suit that at least one of the people we know has at least 10 patients involved in the second lawsuit. I mean, I think this is just horrible for everybody. I mean, yeah, it's horrible that the tank blew up, but oh my God, you know, there's not a single embryologist or person that works there that would have wished this on anyone or prob and probably spent a great deal of time trying to make sure it didn't happen. Uh, you know, I just ache for the people that work there and for the patients, you know, this is, this is a terrible thing to have happen, but the no technology I am familiar with is risk free. And we're human beings and we can make mistakes. And I just don't know of any way where there is no way that I don't know of any way to guarantee to a patient that every sample is going to survive. Every embryo is going to implant. Nothing will ever happen to a sample that's in our care. Well, I think that's another thing that's coming out is insurance. Some clinics are starting to offer insurance to the patients on their stored embryos. And that's interesting. And that's another whole market, I think. But then your insurance will cover it or it won't. Well, you know what's happening for us here in San Francisco is that insurance is saying, you have to get new tanks as soon as your warranty, your tank's warranty is up. So that's every five years. So we have eight tanks here. So every five years we're gonna, and we're a small, relatively small program. So every five years we're gonna have to replace eight tanks at roughly $3,000 a piece. Now, 
None of that compares to the cost of a lawsuit, but it's still, you know, it's going to have to be factored in. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Debbie, you showed in your protocol that uh, the way you vitrify eggs and oocytes are very different. There are substantial substantial differences, yeah. correct? Um, yeah. Marlene, are you in the same, using the same kind of direction where oocytes and embryos are vitrified very differently? And how that oh, yeah. generally? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think oocytes are much, much more sensitive to temperature, especially that first plunge. And Kim Pomeroy uh, had some, you know, I'm a, a verifier for the World Egg Bank. And so Kim has collected a lot of data and done a lot of research on this. And I think his, his he thinks very, his opinion is very strong that the thing that's one of the most critical events in warming an oocyte that I don't think is nearly that important in warming an embryo is the temperature of the first plunge and that, um, Anything you do to that TS file, you know, if you tip it back and forth, you raise the, you lower the temperature. If you pipette it, you lower the temperature. If you leave it out too long, if you don't put it on a warm stage, I mean, everything you do to that TS solution warms it and so, or cools it. So his recommendation is that you start, that the first TS file should be closer to 38 degrees C rather than 37. Because years and years ago, we started, when I first started doing egg freezes, I treated them just like embryos, and it did not work well. Um, it, well, it didn't work at all. And so it took a lot of years to, to improve egg warming, cooling and warming, uh, to the point now where we've got good survival rates. But it's still not... You know, I remember the days where some of the egg banks were telling us that they were, we were going to get, you know, comparable cryo frozen egg pregnancy rates that were comparable to fresh oocyte cycles. And it, I've never achieved that. But so I do think eggs are, are very different from embryos. We have much better pregnancy rates with frozen embryos and they, they are pretty hardy. Awesome. And I think uh, Bill made a comment um, on the chat uh, on the storage. Uh, his recommendation would be when the patient get pregnant, um, it's highly recommended that you move the storage to an outsourced um, uh, place. Just want to acknowledge that. Um, I think we are uh, coming to the end of the webinar. It's 4.25. Um, I would like to give you guys a minute uh, to... Uh, talk about your interests and uh, or, or your affiliation and Debbie if you can talk to, to us about the training program and how You know these things that you do at the training that are related to this webinar that would be appreciated. I'll, I'll start with you Marlene Oh, Okay, um, right now I direct five labs although um, next Tuesday is my last day at uh, the University of Wisconsin so I'm sort of semi-retiring I'm moving out of being on site only to um, direct um, off site labs. Um, so, my, uh, I will be at the University of Wisconsin off site until the end of October. I'm at Laurel Fertility Care. I've been here for 14 years. As I've been off site for the last five. I'm off site for Carolina's Fertility Institute in Winston Salem, Asheville, and Greensboro and uh, Carolina's, or I mean, Caperton Fertility Institute in uh, Albuquerque, and I am at the University of Rochester Strong Fertility. Awesome. Uh, you don't have enough so jobs. You need more jobs, Marlene. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, took, I just took on the new Ovation Lab that's gonna be opening in San Antonio. So that'll oh, cool. Oh, congrats, cool. Not Ovation, not Ovation, sorry, Overture. Whoops. <laughs> All right, slip of the time. <laughs> I was watching. I was part of the Overture Network here. <laughs> awesome. You're now fired. You're now fired, Marlon. <laughs> the shortest tenure in history. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Marlene. Uh, Divi? Um, yeah, so um, Bill and I, my husband, Bill Vinier, who uh, 
Yeah, we started, we opened the World Embryology Skills and Training Laboratory uh, last December. We thought, what better thing to do during COVID but start a new business. So um, we've been talking about it for years and years that, you know, we have such a need for some really rock solid training in um, embryology, very thorough, um, not just two or three or five day courses, but more like a three month course. So we have started um, some three month courses where people come in with no experience and, or very little experience. And we train them to be fully trained um, by the end of that three months with full competency assessments on every task from pipetting, vitrification, warming, ICSI biopsy, andrology. Um, so they, they are trained not only with the techniques but also with the science behind it. So there's lecture material. So like when I train for vitrification, again, I, I'm not teaching people to be robots. I'm, I'm teaching them to be scientists and truly understand what's going on, what's in these solutions, why are these times these ways? Why do we have to use so little media? Why, you know, everything. Why for everything is the key that they understand that. So the students that we've placed into labs at this point, I think would outsmart most of the embryologists in the laboratory because a lot of them were trained on the fly and just trained to do things and they're not really sure why. And uh, the people coming out of West will tell you why in great detail um, as to how everything's working and, you know, basics of andrology. I, mean, I don't know if they'd be able to pass the TS test or not because I'm not sure I could pass the TS test anymore, but um, they, they have a lot of knowledge to match their, their skills and their techniques. So that, that was our goal. Um, we do also offer one week courses in ICSI and biopsy for those junior embryologists who haven't had a chance to get that full training. Um, they can come to us for one week to get a uh, competency assessment and full training in ICSI or biopsy. We do also offer private trainings for lab directors that have specific needs that need to be catered. We have someone that needs to come in for vitrification and embryo transfer, and, and we'll do that. We'll cater it and work one-on-one -on -one with, with embryologists. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's to try to serve a need for our industry. We need embryologists so bad, and we need training. And there's so many people that are just desperate for somebody that's trained. They have people in their lab, and they don't have time to train them. So our goal is to try to help you get the people in your lab trained up, and train up some newbies that are graduating in the biology and life science field and introduce them to embryology and, and bring that up. Because I think, uh, as we all see every week, there's postings all over the country for embryologists. And it's, it's, I feel it's become a crisis. So we need more people training. We need um, more, not only people coming into our field, but the people that are in the field getting their training accelerated. So it's not taking them two and three years to get trained. So that's our goal. We're, we're, we're working on it little by little. We're pumping them out, but um, we need more. So yeah, well, I and, admit, I'm really, I'm really tired of people poaching my people. I'm tired of, I feel like I'm a training center and yeah. because just salaries are outrageous around here. $200,000 for uh, a yeah. A not very well trained senior embryologist and yeah you know if you're a smaller private program you can't compete with that it's it's really an embryologist market right now and yep. a lot of the embryologists know it and they're like pay me or i'm leaving and yep. you know it, that's the market so it's not like <laughs> they're not wrong to try because that you know you go with the market if, if the market was inundated then your salaries aren't going to be real high but right now there's a shortage and uh, you can take advantage of that. But yeah. we're to and you know, what I like about the, you know, how you're approaching the program is you are adding that layer of research to it as well. So when you have yeah. people that like research, you help them do yeah. small research Yeah, so the last projects. three weeks of the, of the three month program, they do their own independent research study. One of my students actually did a little project with Nibiel um, looking at, you know, pulse size and pulse number, and then Nabil ran the, the data, the PGT analysis, just to, to see what that was. And it was, it's really fun. So 
I do also teach them how to read research papers, how to look at data, look at the statistics, how do we, you know, is this good data? Is this retrospective or is this prospective? Is this randomized? Is this control? You know, so that we look at a lot of um, research too and teach them to be able to read a paper and, and tell if it's good or if, if you can get value from this or not. So yeah, the last three weeks are, are their own independent uh, research studies, which is, which is fun. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marlene and Debbie. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and for the discussion. I apologize for not having a camera on. <laughs> kind of weird, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, on uh, next webinar is going to be on uh, September 15. I will send the reminder later about the topic, and uh, I will see you then. Thank you so much. Thanks thank to both you, of you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye. Care. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <coughs>